Today's ruling from the Supreme Court affirms what millions across this country already know to be true in our hearts. Our love is equal. That the four words etched onto the front of the Supreme Court, equal justice under law, apply to us, too. That is Jim Obergefell speaking in front of the Supreme Court in 2015 after their historic ruling in Obergefell v. Hodges. It's my hope that the term gay marriage will soon be a thing of the past, that from this day forward, it will simply be marriage, and our nation will be better off because of it. While the landmark civil rights case ruled that same-sex couples in the U.S. had the fundamental right to marry, as Jim says, we still don't enjoy true marriage equality. We see our relationships treated as less than by county clerks, by judges, bakers, and adoption agencies. And that ongoing fight is what Jim has dedicated his life to. He's now working with the organization Family Equality. They work to advance the legal, lived equality for LGBTQ plus people and their families. Today, we're going to hear all about that. But first, we're going to start with Jim and his late partner, John Arthur, for they had a love story that quite literally changed history. From The Advocate magazine, in partnership with GLAAD, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and A. I want to start by going back, back before your life was radically changed at the Supreme Court. Before that, you're with your partner, John, for 22 years. Can we start with your love story? How did the two of you meet? It was thanks to a mutual friend. This was before I came out. My friend Kevin, we were going out for a drink and we went to a bar near the University of Cincinnati where Kevin and I had both attended and where John, turns out, graduated as well. And it wasn't a gay bar. It was just a campus bar, really. So Kevin and I walked into this bar. And again, I'm still closeted. This is before I quit my job as a high school German teacher. It's before I went to graduate school, before I came out. How old were you? 26. Wait, I'm sorry to cut you off. Did, did you quit your job as a high school German teacher because you knew you couldn't do that and like be out of the closet? No, I quit my job teaching to go to graduate school. Oh, okay. So l- less sensational. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think about my last year of teaching. Was I was I thinking I'm going to finally come out and be honest? No. But I'm sure in the back of my mind that was playing into it. So anyway, Kevin and I went out. We walked into this bar. And sitting at the bar was this tall blonde man. And Kevin said, oh, that's my friend John. And he introduced us. And John scared the daylights out of me because he was out He was so comfortable in who he was, so comfortable in being an out gay man, that I thought for certain he's going to call me out. He's going to see right through my I'm straight lie, and I'm really frightened about this. A couple months later, I had come out. I was back in Cincinnati from graduate school, and Kevin and I went out again. We went back to that same bar, and guess who was still sitting at that bar again, drinking a gin and tonic? John. So we met the second time. And it was during that conversation, at one point, John said, well, Jim, you'd never go out with someone like me. And I have no idea where I came up with the courage or the wit to respond the way I did. How do you know you've never asked? And he still did it. So that was number two. Number three was over the holidays. John, at this point, had a house and he had lots of housemates. And Kevin was one of his housemates. So they were having a New Year's Eve party, and Kevin invited me to that party. So I went to the party. There was John, and I never left. So John and I like to say it wasn't love at first sight. It was love at third sight. Oh, wow. Okay, so that makes me reevaluate some dates I've gone on, and I'm definitely going to send a few texts right after this. (laughs) But seriously, in the mythology of your relationship with John, it says that he gave you a diamond ring about seven weeks into your relationship. Was the implication there that this is a commitment ring or was it purely a gift? I think it was both. I don't really remember if he presented it as kind of a commitment, but by that point, we had had pretty open conversations because relatively quickly, I told him I wanted us to be a couple after that New Year's Eve party and he kept trying to talk me out of it saying, Jim, I'm a mess. I have dated a lot of men. And it's never ended well. And I just refused to be dissuaded. I said, that was other people. I don't care. Let's do this. Let's date. Let's be a couple. So whether or not he actually said this ring symbolizes 
our commitment. I think that was a very big part of it. And so eventually he gets ALS and you're caring for him. And the two of you decide to get legally married. Although you're in Ohio at the time and it's not legal in Ohio. So you flew to Maryland, get married. And that is when the issue of the eventual death certificate comes up. Did that come up so quickly because John was sick? I guess the short answer is yes. You know, when we decided to get married, well, when I spontaneously proposed was on June 26, 2013, when the Supreme Court released their decision in United States versus Windsor, when they struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. It was this realization, here's what we've been waiting for, the opportunity to get married and actually have it carry legal weight for it to be recognized, at least by the federal government. We knew Ohio wouldn't recognize it. So we decided, yes, let's do this. Let's get married. And as you mentioned, we chartered a medical jet and flew to Baltimore, where we got married inside that jet parked on the tarmac. We got married on Thursday. On Saturday, that came out online, that story. And then it was in the Sunday print edition. But what happened on Saturday, friends of ours were at a party where they ran into their friend, Al Gerhardstein, a local civil rights attorney, and they told him about us and about our story. And Al actually ditched the party. He didn't even tell his wife he left, but he went home into his office and started rifling through his documents. And then through our mutual friends, he reached out to ask if we'd be willing to meet. So we met him five days after we got married. And that's when he pulled out a blank Ohio death certificate and said, do you guys get it? This will be wrong when John dies. John would be listed as unmarried. So you are one person filing one lawsuit to affect your one life. At what point did you realize or were you told that it had the potential to be something bigger? I'm certain Al, our attorney, said from the start or close to the start that, you know, depending on how this goes, it has the ability. But to be honest, when John and I filed the suit and started the fight, we were so focused on each other. I mean, to be honest, my life at that point barely existed outside the walls of the room where John's bed was. So on a very logical, rational basis, I knew in the back of my head, well, we're filing this in federal district court and Supreme Court could be, but I really didn't think about that a whole lot because I was so focused on still taking care of John and spending my time and worrying about focusing on my time with him. I was much more worried about that than thinking about the big picture. How much was he aware of what was going on with, with like the legal battles? Oh, he was fully aware. That's one of the things with ALS. Your mind isn't affected. It's your body. So that's good and bad. One, I still had the incredible wit and charm of John as much as he could express as he, his ability to speak kept being impacted. But he was fully John. But the bad side of that is Every day as he lost more and more abilities, he was fully aware of it. So he knew exactly what we were doing. And in fact, after we first met Al and he asked if we wanted to do something, in essence, file a lawsuit, John and I talked about it and we both agreed, yes, we want to fight for our marriage. But John was really clear. He said, Jim, I think this is the right thing to do. I think we should do it. But you have to realize it's all on your shoulders because I can't do anything. He was completely bedridden at that point. And he did die a few months later. You know, on top of everything going on, you've lost your husband, your your partner of 22 years. Did you feel like you were able to mourn for him in that relationship during all this? You know, on one hand, yes. One of the great things about the fight continuing after John passed away. And, you know, he passed away three months to the day we won our first hearing in federal district court. When it really became busy, when the Supreme Court accepted it, and my life started to really change completely. But honestly, for me, the the better part, the, the much more effective way to heal was I got to talk about John every single day. I got to talk about how much I loved him, what a great person he was, what an impact he had on me, and why our marriage, why our relationship was worth fighting for. So that helped me with my grieving. I really feel lucky that I that I had that opportunity. And so from the filing of that first court case to the Supreme Court, it was like about a two-year process. I guess I'm trying to like beat around the bush, but like just like point blank, a long legal process is expensive. Who paid for this? 
Our attorney, Al Gerhardstein, number one, an absolutely amazing man. He's been fighting for civil rights for more than four decades and just a kind person as well. So he made it easy to, to consider this and to say yes. From the start, I'm not sure if it's everything that he does, but at least our case was done pro bono. He said, I will represent you and John. And when we win, I will submit a bill to the courts for reimbursement of all of my expenses, which is what happened. He actually got to submit everything to the state of Ohio and the state of Ohio had to pay those legal bills. Wow. And so with the other couples that you mentioned from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Michigan, the the four of you were the plaintiffs for the Supreme Court case. Because your team filed first, the entire thing became known as Obergefell v. Hodges, that has your name on that. What did it feel like when you found that out? It was going to carry your name. Surreal is the short answer. You know, when Al told me that there was the possibility it would be known as Obergefell v. Hodges, assuming the Supreme Court followed their traditional procedure of naming it after the lowest, a consolidated case after the lowest case number. He said, just just know that it could be known as Obergefell v. Hodges. And when they announced it, it was it was overwhelming. It was, I mean, I mentioned surreal, but I also felt guilty because I wasn't the only plaintiff, and John's and my story wasn't the only story in this case. You know, there were more than 30 plaintiffs total in the cases from the four states. And that was another widower, John's and my, our funeral director, all the way down to Cooper, a two-year-old boy who was adopted in Ohio by Joe and Rob, who live in Manhattan. So I felt guilty because suddenly it went from there are so many of us to the focus being on my name, my face, John's and my story. Oh, because there's many faces of like this movement, but there became just one name of the movement. Correct. And I was always worried that the stories of the other plaintiffs in this case, which were equally as compelling, equally as important, would be overlooked, would be forgotten. So it, it did. It, it raised a fair amount of guilt in me because it wasn't just about me. And one of the other things that I surprise people with is so many people think that, you know, Jim, you must have gone through an an audition process. You must have applied somewhere to be a plaintiff. Not at all. It wasn't anything like that. It purely was. John and I got married. And because we were in the news, Al happened to hear about our story. It just was kind of kismet, synchronicity. It all came together and happened. But yeah, there was no interview process. There was know anything. It was simply John and I filed suit to fight for our for our marriage. You know, there was this belief at the time that what you were doing with your case was a mistake, that it was too early to bring a case like this to the Supreme Court because they were not going to rule in your favor and it was going to set back the entire movement. Was that something that you were hearing a lot of? I did not, but Al certainly did get that pushback. After we filed our case and won, He started hearing from national organizations saying, Al, drop this case. This is not the right case. This case does not fit our, meaning those organizations, does not fit our strategy for winning marriage equality. Drop it. And Al, every single time he got that pushback, he said, no. My job as John and Jim's attorney is to fight for their rights, to fight on their behalf. I will not drop this. It is the right case for them. And he eventually won everyone over to his side. But there was a significant amount of pushback that he experienced. Did I ever experience that firsthand? No. Al was really good about keeping me involved, keeping John and me involved when we needed to, but also weeding out the things we didn't need to worry about, especially when John was still alive. And so about three months later, the ruling comes out and you're there. You hear it read out. How did that feel to be there and hear that? Uh, sitting in that courtroom, listening to Justice Kennedy read his decision. You know, when he started reading the summary, my initial reaction was, great, we won. And he kept reading. And I'm not an attorney. So legal writing isn't always the clearest. And I found myself wondering, well, did we win? I'm really not sure. (laughs) But as he continued on, it really just hit me. Yeah, we did win. And I burst into tears. People around the courtroom were crying. Al, our attorney, was there in the courtroom as as well. And he told me later he has never seen so many attorneys crying in a courtroom. 
And of course, not surprising, my first thought was, John, I wish you were here. I wish you could experience this. I wish you could know that our marriage will exist for good. Ohio can never erase it. But then it hit me that for the first time in my life as an out gay man, I felt like an equal American. And that was such a powerful realization, such a powerful feeling to have sitting in the highest court in our country. I imagine it's not dissimilar to the like post-wedding depression that newly married couples feel. Like everything was leading up to this one big day and now it's over and it's like, okay, like now what do we do? No, I can honestly say I don't think I ever felt that. And by that point, you know, I knew this decision before it came out, if the decision went the way we wanted, hoped and expected it to go, then I knew my life was going to be crazy going forward. And even that day when that decision came out, going out onto the plaza in front of the courthouse, you know, to read a statement to the press, then to do interviews, to get a phone call from President Obama, there was certainly no letdown, no no depression that followed that decision because my life changed so drastically. And most importantly, I just kept running into people across the country who would stop me on the street or in an airplane to shake my hand, to thank me, to hug me, to show me photos of someone they love or of their marriage, of their partner, their significant other. It still is a gift every single time that happens. Any depression post-decision came about from the people who weren't happy with that decision, let's say Kim Davis. Everything, you know, with the, the fight for religious freedom to refuse service to the LGBTQ plus community in a business open to the public, to give healthcare providers, doctors, the ability to say, no, I will not care for you because your identity, the person you are, the fact that you're LGBTQ plus offends my vaguely defined but deeply held religious beliefs. And that is what most of your work today revolves around. You said that like, despite you know, winning this court case that we still do not enjoy full marriage equality. Can you explain that for people? Absolutely. Across our country, we have the right to get married. We have that constitutional right. But we don't actually enjoy marriage equality because, as I mentioned, Kim Davis, you have public officials who are there who are supposed to serve every single person in their, their state who refuse to do that, who won't issue a marriage license or who won't perform that ceremony in the courtroom because it happens to be LGBTQ plus people. You have businesses like Masterpiece Bake Shop who don't want to bake a cake for a same-sex couple. You know, the Bostock decision. You had a funeral home where the owner of the funeral home decided that Amy Stevens, that she did not deserve to have her job and she could be willy-nilly fired because she didn't fit the owner's idea of what a man or a woman is. There are all of these ways that our marriages are not equal. I'm here in Ohio. We still don't have statewide non-discrimination protections. So even with Bostock, even with all of the wins we've had, a couple can get married on Saturday and on Monday, they could lose their job. They could be evicted from their apartment. It's just all of these ways that People like to say, no, your marriage isn't the same and we don't respect it and we don't think it deserves what other marriages get. And so passing marriage equality, as we did in 2015, it was, you know, step one. It was not all steps in the fight. Correct. And that was even one of the things shortly after marriage equality, I think it was Empire State Equality, which was a statewide equality organization in New York, announced that they were closing shop because we're done. We're equal. And even then, I thought, how on earth can you say that? Yes, marriage was this enormous step forward, this great thing that we now have. But even back then, we weren't equal in so many other ways. So marriage was fantastic, but it certainly did end our, end our fight. Well, my fear is that we're going to end up 
similar to when you got married in 2013, there are 13 states that had marriage equality, and so you flew to another state to have your marriage and then flew back to Ohio. I fear that we're going to have this patchwork of different states with drastically different protections in each of them. This extends to beyond just LGBTQ clauses. We can see a very similar thing happening right now with abortion, where it's effectively illegal in some states and legal in others. That's my fear for our immediate future. Oh, I agree with you 100%. You know, that was part of part of our argument. This is unworkable to, to say you have these rights, you have these protections here, but as soon as you cross a border, they're gone. That isn't workable. To be honest, I'm still stunned that the Supreme Court ruled the way they did on Bostock. Bostock was the one that for um, LGBTQ employment discrimination. Correct. Saying that it's no different than discriminating on the basis of sex. That gave me hope. You know, the Supreme Court has changed since that decision with the addition of Amy Coney Barrett, and she certainly is not our friend. But I'm not as despondent over our rights at the Supreme Court as I might have been at one point. Maybe I'm being foolish in that, but we'll see. Well, we have enough pessimism, so it's okay to hear, you know, (laughs) like 5% of hope. Yes. You know, one of the things I have a hard time squaring away is that marriage equality passed for many different reasons, but one of them is that it affected the entire community, every single letter, and we rallied behind it. But when it comes to these other issues that only affect, you know, certain subsets of the LGBT community, we seem to be less invested. And I don't, I don't see us, like, rallying around one cause anymore right now. You're right. There, There isn't really one cause when I think about our community and what, what we're vocal about currently. And this is related, but it's also one of my pet peeves with the LGBTQ plus community. I look at it this way. If I'm demanding equal rights, civil rights for me as a gay man, then I better damn well be demanding those same things for every other member of the LGBTQ plus community. Additionally, I also better be demanding that for every other marginalized community. If I'm asking for something for myself, I have no right to do that if I'm not asking it for everyone else. That's one of the things that I just get frustrated about within our community and just the transphobia and the racism within the LGBTQ plus community. Offensive, harmful, hurtful, and I wish we could, I wish we as a community could stop that. Your case, up until 2020, the ruling about employment discrimination, your case was the largest conferral of rights for LGBTQ people in U.S. history. And I think for me, like the most shocking part now is that just a few years later, it seems so unextraordinary to be gay and to be able to get married. And that has changed us so, that's changes happen so quickly. Do, do you feel that way too? Oh, absolutely. But you know what? I also think about my remarks following the decision in front of the Supreme Court it was along the lines of one day, this will no longer be known as gay marriage or same sex marriage. It is just simply marriage. And that's what's happening. How many hundreds of thousands of couples have gotten married since June 26, 2015? I love it. And the great thing about that is every time a couple says, I do, it's having an impact in their family, in their friends, in their community. And it's just that constant reinforcement that our marriage, our love is no different than any other. It's it's becoming just part of every day life as it should be. And that's why people ask me all the times, are you worried about the Supreme Court overturning marriage equality? And my response, again, is informed by people much smarter than I am, especially around the Supreme Court. But I say, no, I'm I'm not worried about Obergefell v. Hodges being overturned. I'm worried about the fact that we still don't have marriage equality. But Obergefell v. Hodges, I don't believe will be overturned because of those hundreds of thousands of marriages. And the fact that Gay marriage, same-sex marriage, really has become just marriage. Can you imagine the mess it would create if the Supreme Court said, oh, no, we're overturning that? And the Supreme Court typically also doesn't take away rights that were previously affirmed by the court. That's what I focus on. And I love that same-sex marriage has just become marriage. It's the way it should be. I mean, it's just funny that, like, these historic decisions, like, the veil of history makes it seem like they're hundreds and hundreds of years old, and, like, the man talking to me now should be in his 90s. (laughs) Sometimes I feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) Same. And yet you are in your 50s. You know, this whole thing started because you were 
in love? Do you have desires to be in another relationship now? I'm open to it. And a big part of why is, especially the last year of John's life, he would tell me directly or, you know, that we had friends or family members who would come and visit and give me a break so I could go for a walk, whatever. And almost without exception, when I came back, that friend or family member would say, John asked me to remind you and to tell you again that when he's gone, he wants you to love again. So I'm open to it just because I would love someone in my life, but it's also because I feel like I have to be open to it because John asked me to. If you want to learn more about Jim and his work, you can also see him in the new Netflix docuseries hosted by Will Smith. That's called Amend and is streaming on Netflix right now. And then special thank you to Eric Marcus, who connected Jim and me. Eric is the host of the Making Gay History podcast, which if you've not yet checked out, I personally think you're making a huge mistake. Last year, they put out an episode that is the earliest known recording of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. If you're looking for a place to start there, I highly recommend it. We're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I will see you next week. Bye.